okay, hopefully we've watched American Beauty, we've watched the first lecture, we've looked at the viewing questions, um, started thinking about your discussion paper for this week. Um, what I want to do now, now that you've seen the film, is basically break down the five uh, elements of film form and how uh, you might think about certain uh, bits of literary design or sound design, etc. Let's jump right in. Uh, literary design, I, I just want to walk through the characters, really. I think that's perhaps the most interesting thing. Uh, besides the structure of the film, we get voiceovers on both ends, the beginning and the end. Um, we get, again, this ghost or this angel or this god or this whatever talking to us after the fact of life. Um, that's kind of interesting, the way that punctuates uh, the film. But, Lester, we try to sort of summarize some big ideas you might think about. On one level, this is what we call a, bildung, a Bildungsroman. I can never say that word. A coming-of-age story. It's basically about a dude who learns to live life the way he wants to. Um, some questions that, gets ra that, gets raised, that get raised. Um, when you're living life the way you want to, what does that mean about your treatment of other people, right? On one level, I think this is about multiple visions of American life. He gets the American dream, right? He has a beautiful house, a beautiful family, he lives in the suburbs, blah, blah, blah. And it seems wildly unfulfilling. So one thing his character might ask us to question, um, is the social destiny that's been laid out for us uh, fulfilling? Is that life worth living? Um, or do you need to think about it a certain way? Basically what Lester does, right? He starts imagining, he starts fantasizing, perhaps very inappropriately about a young girl, but he's using his imagination, which doesn't seem to be used previously to that. I'll talk about visual design and the, the roses and all those like fantasy images later on. Um, he basically reverts to what we think of as a traditional rebellious teenage life. Quits his job, uh, gets rid of responsibility, and uh, starts getting high and works at a fast food joint, something we might think of, even though it's not, but might think of as a, a teenage job, especially in suburbia, like something to do to make some side money. And he says at one point to Ricky, um, man, I love my teenage life. It was so great. All I did was party and get laid, as if that's all there is to life. And what some people might argue when you look at Lester's character arc, the original draft of the story, Alan Ball's original draft, he actually has sex with Angela. That is what happens at the end of the movie, but it's felt the same way. It's, he's obtained enlightenment. He's done everything he wants to do. He's the perfect American now. So I think a very, very, very different idea. It was actually Lester, not Lester, Kevin Spacey and Sam Mendes that changed the script to say, no, let's have it. He says no to Angela. Um, and that's the thing that uh, ushers him into real adulthood. So uh, one way of thinking about Lester's sort of journey would be um, freedom to get high or have sex or whatever. Freedom without responsibility is actually maybe empty. I'm not saying that as a person you have to think that way, but the film might be asking us to think that. Um, that if all you're doing is just doing whatever you want, then that's kind of empty and stupid, useless. If all you're doing is following cultural rules for you, that's equally empty, useless, stupid. There seems to be, Lester, before he dies, seems to figure out um, for himself, uh, gosh, man, being a dad might have been great. That scene with him and Angela in the kitchen where he's making her friend, uh, grilled cheese and she's drinking a Coke and all that sort of jazz. He's a dad. He, he's someone who cares about someone else, he's, who wants to be nurturing and present. And his own desires he thought were sexual desires seem to actually be ethical desires. I just want to be intimate with somebody. I want to talk. I want to feel real. Um, pretty, I hope, cool, interesting moment there. Um, Carolyn, you know, a woman in the workforce, uh, probably has to fight hard for respect, all that sort of jazz, um, looking for freedom in similar ways. Um, all the stuff about the self-help uh, tapes she's listening to, um, the way she changes her look and appearance after she starts cheating on Lester with the real estate king. The guy has the weirdest eyebrows in the world. Um, so how we might think of either, we could think of control freaks, we might think of mothers, we might think of women and what they have to do uh, to maintain a powerful position in the workplace. Um, also, she seemed to imply that she grew up, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't call it poor, but um, not affluent. And we seem to get this dream in America, you have to get rich, you have to get rich. So she seems to be struggling with the anxieties and the tensions of that. Um, man, I, you know, you can definitely think about the gun situation. 
uh, when she's sleeping with the real estate king, he says something to the effect of, um, nothing makes me feel more powerful than firing a gun. So, you know, what is a gun? Uh, what are guns worth? Uh, what value do they have? How is the real estate king's relationship with firearms maybe different than someone who, you know, lives in Chillicothe and has some guns and hunts and uh, there seems to be a, a, a different way of looking at guns that he has than uh, maybe some people in Southern Ohio where I'm living right now, um, or maybe not. Um, is there legitimate power and authority in having a gun? Um, what does Carolyn think about doing with that gun, etc.? So uh, if you're interested in sort of the gun debate, you can take any side you want and sort of think about how the film talks about that or get rid of the way we traditionally talk about gun legislation, gun control, and just say as a symbol, what's the gun in this movie? Is it another phallic representation? Is it another you know, male position of power in that when Carolyn picks up the gun, she now has sort of masculine authority and power? Or is there something totally different going on? Um, so lots to think about regarding Carolyn, maybe especially how she hugs Lester's clothes after she finds out that he's dead. Um, I want to talk about Janie, Angela, and Ricky kind of together. Um, Rick and Jane, Dick and Jane, if you know those names from sort of the 50s, that sort of traditional white bread um, teenage character um, who's trying to come into their own. We get, we get Janie, you know, a very beautiful woman who wants to get a breast augmentation, uh, feels sort of dowdy, feels ugly, feels broken next to Angela, angel, perfection, etc., who's also, who seems to be lying greatly about her life. She seems to think that being sexualized is the coolest, best, most important thing a woman can be. Gee, I wonder where she gets that idea. Sorry to be sarcastic. It seems like she is the, the image of the child that we want to create in this culture. Uh, we push these sexualized images like crazy, and she seems to be just modeling that, adapting to that. Or maybe she knows how to adapt to the inappropriate sexual advances of older men. That seems to be something she talks about um, throughout the film. So all of those weird, difficult, challenging things with Angela. And then visually how she looks from the opening shots when we see her to looking like maybe even a 12-year-old girl. She looks so innocent at the end of the kitchen. So that sort of transformation of that character. Um, and her sort of obsessions about normalcy, about trying to be extraordinary, about wanting to be important. And maybe beauty is what gets me there. Or maybe stories of sex get me to look extraordinary or to be something. There's nothing worse than being ordinary, she says. And then there's Ricky. First of all, think about his name. Ricky fits. Or maybe Ricky doesn't fit, right? Um, Ricky's use of drugs seems to be strange, right? He might be the hero of the film. Uh, Lester actually calls him a hero at one point. Um, he doesn't seem to be um, controlled by social destiny the way most people I know are, the way I am. Uh, I have to go to work. I have to be responsible to the people around me. My desires, the things I might want, are seventh or eighth in line uh, in a day. But for Ricky, uh, besides accommodating his father, which you know might be his one little sticking point, he seems to do what he wants. He seems to have no problem breaking law or manipulating to feel in a way that he wants to feel. Maybe the way that we can look about Ricky or think about Ricky is through his videotaping. Is that a beautiful, extraordinary way to find beauty and passion in the world? He actually says he sees God through a dead woman's eyes that he videotapes. Or is that a weakness? having no faith that beauty can come again tomorrow, so we need to hold on to it. Is he a miser? Is he, I can't experience life, I need to distance myself, videotape it, and then have kind of a fake beautiful life on the video screen, but not actually in real life. Um, and again, I'm just trying to give quick glosses, ways we might think about these characters. Uh, and feel free to fight against, develop, um, come up with brand new ideas than what I'm talking about here. Um, but perhaps the, the, the real scene that I want to think about with Janie, Ricky, and Angela is the bedroom scene where um, Ricky comes over after. We have those sort of dual home abuse scenes. Uh, Angela, I'm sorry, um, Janie gets slapped by her mom. And then in the other house, Ricky gets beaten by his father. Um, and so that weird, I should say weird, those depictions of domestic violence inside of suburbia, very intense in different ways. There's also that, what I think is meant to be very innocent scene where Janie exposes herself to Ricky as if to say, I feel broken, I feel unbeautiful, here I am. And of course, Ricky ignoring her nakedness and focusing solely on her face and all the different modes of intimacy that might be involved with uh, those images. But after all that, Angela gets very mad at both of them because they seem to be living a life and getting intimate and get together and they might leave for New York. Um, 
And Angela said something like, well, at least I'm not ordinary. And Ricky, deadpan, yes, you are. And he sort of explains that from his point of view, she is totally ordinary. She is exactly ordinary. Somebody who wants to be nothing but beautiful, who will lie and manipulate and make other people feel bad about themselves just so that they can feel important. Or at least that's how Ricky seems to see Angela. Um, and to cut through the bullshit, if you will, to cut through all the drama and the nonsense and just be able to say, this is what I see, this is what's going on, and this is what I want, um, without having to worry about everyone's feelings and thoughts. So maybe something very powerful in Ricky or maybe something very rude and inappropriate about Ricky. Um, and then maybe, uh, can't go too much further without talking about Frank Fitz, uh, the actual murderer of Lester. The original screenplay has Frank, um, in court, actually, the way it sort of works out, um, the original screenplay, Frank Fitz uses that initial videotape of Ricky, where Ricky and, uh, Janie are talking about killing Lester as, um, evidence. He plants evidence to get his son framed. So Ricky Fitz is in jail for the murder of Lester Burnham, and Frank Fitz is sort of orchestrating this to make himself free. I'm glad the film doesn't actually do that. It would be a, a totally different sort of vibe, more of a CSI episode or a Law & Order episode than the film we get. But the thing about Frank, of course, um, he's wildly homophobic, he's wildly anti-gay, uh, but of course he is gay, or at least he has homosexual desires and urges. Um, there's a scene in the original screenplay, again, where he is having sex with a man in Vietnam. Um, is it to say he is gay and all of his violence towards homosexuality, all of his language, even maybe his violence towards his son comes from uh, self-hatred or self-loathing. Maybe similar to Angela, he has adopted or internalized what the culture sh thinks of him and then he thinks that way about himself. Maybe other ways to think about it as well. Uh, just some dominant readings that other critics have said about the film. So that's all sort of uh, literary design. Thinking about those characters, thinking about how those characters present themselves, and maybe some of the ideas or challenges they bring um, toward, uh, to the table. I'm going to create another lecture um, that develops this idea. This was all about lit characters. Um, we're going to look at cinematography, visual design, editing, and sound in the next lecture.